Well, thanks for the opportunity to come out and um, speak to all of you about a topic that is, of course, of great interest to, uh, to me and probably to um, anybody who's actually interested in the topic of entrepreneurship, which is uh, angel investing. You know, there's a lot of things I could uh, talk about related to uh, angel investing, and I decided that actually probably the best focus was to take this from the perspective of entrepreneurs trying to raise money from angels, because odds are, in any audience, that there are going to be far more people looking to raise money from angels than there are going to be people coming to hear about angel investing, looking to give money out to entrepreneurs. So um, while we could, I can answer questions at the end from any perspective, and I'll touch a little bit on the perspective of investors and what their, um, uh, how people might be better at angel investing, I'm going to really focus on the perspective of the entrepreneur. So first, I, I, I want to define the topic that I'm talking about. So what's a business angel? So there's this broad category of people who we call informal investors. That's anybody who's using their own money to put into other people's private companies. Within that broad group of informal investors, we have what we tend to think of on the one hand is friends and family, and on the other hand, angels. And the angels are different from the friends and family because they will invest in people who they don't actually know. That is, they're not family members and they're not friends of theirs. And so within the broad category of informal investors, angels are this uh, subset. When we think about this, one of the problems in kind of talking about angels and understanding them is that there's an incredibly large variety of people who engage in this activity, and they have all kinds of different goals, and they have all kinds of different objectives, and they have all kinds of different uh, knowledge. So one of the first things that's important that's out there is whether people are accredited investors or not. The accredited investor is this legal term that the SEC has for essentially being a high net worth individual or um, a high income individual. Now, high net worth actually, um, these days actually probably means a little bit more than it did six months ago, but it's a million dollars or more in net worth and uh, $300,000 or more for income as a married couple or $200,000 or more as a single individual. So some people who are angels are these accredited investors, but actually the majority of people who do this are not. And that's actually one thing that's important because out there, there's going to be these two categories, what these accredited investors are looking for and then what the unaccredited investors. Then there's active and passive investors. We often like to think about angels as, oh, they're active, they're very involved with the startups, they want to help out, they want to get involved with entrepreneurs. Yes, some. Some angels actually want to write a check, and that's it. They don't really want to get involved. And that category is very different than somebody who may have been a former entrepreneur who wants to get deeply involved with working with startups. Related to that is some people actually really know a lot about entrepreneurship and a lot about investing in startups, and some are quite naive about the process, that they may not even know the um, stages that companies go through in their development. They may not know about different ways that people exit from these investments. There's also kind of an interesting thing that not everybody wants to invest in the early stages of, of um, uh, startups. In fact, there are some angels who are actually most interested in later stage companies. When I did some work a few years ago for um, several of the Federal Reserve Regional Banks looking at angel investing and doing focus groups all over the country. Actually, one of the people participating in those focus groups uh, here um, was uh, Mal Mixon, who is the chairman of Inv Invicare. And his perspective was, I I'm actually not interested in startups. I've made, I've had all my success in investing through leverage buyouts, and I want to back people who are doing leverage buyouts because it's actually something I understand. I don't really understand high-tech startups. So it could be people who want to invest in later stage ventures. It could be large amounts of money, it could be small amounts of money. In fact, the median investment is pretty small. The typical investment is about $10,000 that people put in. High and low risk investors. Some people are actually trying to get one blockbuster investment out of a larger group. Some people are trying to get, actually trying to do 
a little bit more of a, a sort of lower return across several uh, investments. Another thing that's important is the kind of common perception we get is you want to get in money from an angel, you're going to have to give up equity. That's probably true for sophisticated angel groups, but it turns out that a, big, a significant minority of angels, including some who are accredited investors, use debt and will finance people with debt. And that's something we tend not to think of as something that angels do, but it actually it does happen. And then investors could be acting individually on their own or actually as part of a broader group to make those investments. In fact, one of the biggest growth areas of angel investing in recent years is this sort of growth of group investors, people collectively organizing to do that, although it's still a kind of small portion of the, of the total. Now, one thing that's kind of important to keep in mind is keep in perspective where people really get money when they finance startups. Almost nobody gets money from an outside investor. A very small percentage of people do. This is actually about 10% or less of people in the early stages of the business, when the business is first getting going in the first year or so, are going to get money from an outside investor. The vast majority of people are going to get it from their own savings or perhaps a personally guaranteed bank loan, which is actually these days becoming less common. So the, venture, the angel capital market isn't that large. It's roughly the same size as the venture capital market. Both of them are in the $20 billion a year range. That's the size of the, of the markets across the country. Now, to understand that in perspective, informal investors, that is friends, families, and angels combined are $162 billion. So you can keep in mind that most of that money that comes from outsiders is coming from friends and family. It's not coming from angels. And actually, when we look at the investments themselves, only about 8% of those in, um, informal investments are made by angels, but 92% are made by friends and family. So one thing to keep in mind is that you really have to have a reason to be focused on that smaller segment of the market, the angel segment, rather than the broader section of friends and family. If we try to say, what are your odds of getting angel investing if you have the typical country, company in the United States, right? there's about a 0.2% chance you're going to get an angel investment. There's about, angels invest in about 0.2% of companies. What that means is, for most entrepreneurs, for most businesses, angels are not where they're going to get financing. But they are very important for certain types of startups. For certain groups of startups, they make sense. And so one of the really important things to think about is, am I going to have the kind of business, as we go through this presentation, that would fit what angels want? Because if it's you just got the typical business, very low odds. I actually talk about this same statistic, or very close to this statistic, when I talk about uh, venture capital. It turns out that if you're, the odds of getting a venture capital investment are um, less than the odds of dying from a fall in the shower. So I always tell my MBAs to not practice their elevator pitch in the shower. They should concentrate on not falling. The numbers aren't quite as bad for angels. It's actually that your odds are about five times higher that the IRS will audit you than you will get an angel investment. So um, you can think about it in that uh, perspective. So what's the typical person out there making these investments? Now, the typical angel okay, is not some guy in Silicon Valley who sits out there on a yacht in San Francisco Bay, kind of sipping Chardonnay, okay, looking for people who have the next company that went public, will go public, sort of just after his um, business. That's a kind of image that we get because all the press always wants to talk about stories about the uh, angel invested in, in, in Google and you know went from a hundred thousand dollar investment to 124 million. I mean that's great, right? It's actually the greater investment is the uh, investment of eight thousand uh, pounds in the body shop for 50 percent ownership of the body shop. That that was an even bigger uh, angel investment. But that's not typical. What's typically is a ten thousand dollar investment in a 
cash flow positive business, okay? And with no better knowledge or expertise in terms of entrepreneurship or making these informal investments than friends and family. And that angel does not attract venture capital follow on investment. So the typical angel is actually somebody from your community where they just want to give some money and they're, they're expectations are not particularly high returns. There's probably not a very high expectation that your company will go public or get acquired by a public company or anything like that. That kind of angel, the typical angel, is not going to be right for the truly high potential, high growth businesses. The kind of business where somebody wants an angel because they're going to try to take their company public or they're going to try to get it, um, get it acquired at a very high valuation. But there may be some others kind of, if you have a business where you might get to seven or eight million dollars of sales in six or seven years, if that's the target that you have, that's where the typical angels are going to be, in more in that kind of space. Because the angels that are really successful in doing this, they're looking for businesses that can hit $50 million in sales or more in five years. Okay? Approximately 500 US startups a year actually make that cut. Right? So they're looking for needles um, in, in, in a haystack. Okay? So this kind of brings me to angel groups because the space of where the high potential entrepreneurs have tended to go in the past several years are to these groups of angels who are getting together, banding together, investing collectively in startup companies. And people who are in angel groups are not, they don't look at all like the typical angels. First of all, Essentially, everyone in an angel group is an accredited investor. They're all high net worth, high income individuals. And the reason for that is that when you try to raise money from somebody who's a high net worth or high income individual, this may sound shocking in the current economic environment, but the SEC assumes that wealthy people are sophisticated investors. Right? That's probably not true, but that's the government's um, belief about this. And as a result, there are fewer disclosures that are required. Groups can get themselves into a lot of trouble if they have some members that are not accredited, because then the question is, you never know whether then the entrepreneurs would have to make the disclosures necessary for all the unaccredited investors if there's one unaccredited investor in the group. So the safer way to do it is just say, if you're not accredited, if you can't sign off saying, I'm an accredited investor, you can't be in the group. The second is they tend to be more active. They actually try to be more involved in startup companies. And they're doing this actually not to just write a check, but often to become more involved. And they tend to be more knowledgeable. And I say tend to be more knowledgeable because this is a spectrum. And at the end of the top, the most successful members of angel groups, of which I am not one, okay, those people who are really very, very successful tend to be very knowledgeable at the operational levels of how to build and take public um, uh, startup companies. The mainstream of angel groups are people who are knowledgeable about startups more so than the kind of typical angel, but they probably have not had an operational role in building um, a startup company. They probably have not invested in a lot of successful startups themselves. There's a tendency to favor the kind of typical standard model of angel investing that we tend to hear about, which is invest in high growth, high potential, early stage, technology businesses. They tend to provide more money than the typical angels, and they're tending to make equity investments. That's the idea that they have. This is what people, if you've got a high potential company, the kind of company where you think you can build this to this sort of $50 million of sales in five or six years, if that's your goal, if your goal is to take a company public, if your goal is to get this company acquired by some public company, if that's what you're trying to build, that's the set of angels where the space is, is most um, appropriate. The thing that's important, though, is that this is not a high volume game. This is actually a very rare thing. In 2006, there were angel groups invested in 512 companies in the United States. That's out of 25.4 million businesses. Now, probably. The statistics, probably there are angel groups out there, about half of the angel groups that are out there, we probably don't know. So you could probably double that number, but it's not going to be much more than double the number. It's probably no more than 1,000 
uh, businesses. And in 2006, the groups in total invested $250 million of capital. And so even if we doubled the number, we're at a half a billion, right, of this kind of $23 uh, billion. This is a small number. Much like venture capitalists, it's investing in only a few companies. And venture capitalists only invest in about 1,700 companies a year in the US, right? So it's not that much larger. But the idea is there's a small number of super high potential businesses, and that's what people are, are going after in these groups. So what does the typical group look like? Well, um, most of them are structured like a network. That is, a group of people who get together Right, sit around a room much like this one, have an entrepreneur present to them and then make a decision whether they want to invest, but they write their own checks as individuals. The minority are structured like the North Coast Angel Fund here, which is actually a fund where people wrote a check to the fund, put their money in collectively, and then the fund, the members collectively vote on where the fund's money is going to go. That's the less common. So in Northeast Ohio, the two big ones that we have are Arch um, Angels, um, which is located in, down in um, Akron, which is a network structure, and North Coast Angel Fund up in Cleveland, which is a fund structure. Um, most of them are member-led, although some of them have managers that are hired to lead them. So um, in the case of the North Coast Angel Fund, there's actually professional managers paid to run the fund Okay, essentially paid actually in this case out of um, uh, funding that comes from uh, uh, Jumpstart to support the angel fund. Okay, and the other thing that's kind of important, and I've kind of put this up um, at the end, is they're, the average one is young. They're only three years old, and this they have come out of nowhere, which means. If you go to an angel group and you say, well, what's happened to the investments that most of those investors have made? The answer is, we don't know, okay? Because they haven't exited any of those. And the problem is they haven't had the companies go bankrupt and they haven't had the companies get acquired or go public. They've just made the investments. Now, you could go to some of the older ones, like the Tech Coast Angel um, uh, Fund in um, California or the Band of Angels in um, Silicon Valley, where they've been doing this for 20 years. And they can talk about having uh, close to 8 or 9% of the companies that they uh, invested in having these um, successful exits. Actually, in the case of Band of Angels, it would be even higher than that. But for the ones we have here, we don't know if they're any good. We don't know what they've done, because we don't have that. And there's about 37 members. Okay, So these are kind of moderate-sized groups of people. Okay, How many of pe people are in these groups? We're talking about 5,600 people across the whole country. Right? Again, small numbers here. All are accredited investors. Many of these people have experience with high growth startups, and many have made multiple angel investments. If you're interested in finding an investor who can actually provide some assistance to you, your chances are much better in an angel group. And I phrase that in a probabilistic sense, because even if you go to an angel group, you still stand the chance that the people who are investing in you don't actually know that much to be able to help you and give you assistance, but the odds are just higher uh, there. Those individuals are investing about $30,000 per investment round. So the typical angel, when investing alone, about $10,000. The typical person, as part of an angel group, is putting in about $30,000, so about three times um, as much. What are these groups looking for? What are they trying to find? Early stage businesses. Now, I want to clarify a little bit what early stage means. Because in the structure of startups, that's not the earliest stage. The earliest stage tend to be seed stage businesses. A seed stage business is an entrepreneur with an idea and a business plan, maybe. In an early stage business, the business is actually operational, but probably hasn't gr grown yet. Angel groups have a preference for early stage more so than the seed stage. 
What that means is if you're trying to do this, when you've got a business plan and you're thinking of starting a business, you try to go to these um, groups for funding and chances are you're going to be unsuccessful and you're going to be sent away to come back later. That what you probably need to do is fund your business somehow with your own savings, get it off the ground, and then when you need capital to actually get it moving forward and growing, then you need to go to those angels. That's the prime time for that set of people. You've got to have very high potential for growth. Okay? You've got Essentially, the, the, the sort of rule of thumb for people is they're looking for businesses that can do $50 million in sales in five years. As I said, this is actually very rare. About 500 companies a year in the United States do this. But what people are doing is trying to sort through and find those because that's where the phenomenal returns are. You got to have an exit, right? Otherwise, if there's no plan to exit the business, the investors are not going to be able to see the liquidity that they want, right? An initial public offering, although in the current environment it's really acquisition, that this business will get sold out to somebody else. And it'll be sold out in not that long. So if your goal is to run a business for the rest of your life that you started, you don't want an angel. They're just going to cause all kinds of conflict um, and, and um, problems because the angel is not going to be able to be successful from their perspective if they can't get, you that, get that business sold in, say, seven years. The group is investing in the order of magnitude of about 250000 Now, what's interesting about this is I told you that they're making about a $30,000 investment, and the groups have about 37 members right, on average. So one of the things that's pointing out is that for the groups, not everybody invests in every investment. And one of the advantages that that does is it provides an advantage for going to a, a network as opposed to a fund. Because the fund is voting yes or no collectively. A network is voting I'm interested or I'm not. right? And so you can go to present to 50 people in the network, pick up four of them that are interested, and that might be the capital that, that you need. So what's this process look like for these groups? Well, first, they got to get the deals. How do groups get the deals? Well, one of the nice things about angel groups is they're observable. We can see them, so we can kind of find, you can go to them and ask them for, for money. You can send a business plan in. Well, there's sort of two ways that they get this. Unsolicited, they you know all these groups have um, uh, websites. You can send in a business plan and then get it, it evaluated or it's through the members kind of pulling in ones that they recommend. There's clearly a bias here. You're talking about people making decisions under incredible uncertainty about the prospects of a business. Okay, People don't really know which of these businesses are going to be successful and which aren't. In that kind of environment, your odds are so much better of getting funded if you are being recommended and there's a social relationship that you have to the people making that decision. Because that's how people make decisions when they can't figure out a decision, is they go with somebody that they know. Initial screen usually weeding out about 60 to 90 percent. What's the, what does the initial screen mean for these groups? It's basically, is there no chance? What does no chance mean? Well, I think I want to open an automobile body shop, and so I send a business plan to an angel group. That's a no chance business. It's not going to meet the general criteria that the uh, angels are looking for. I'm going to start a bakery. Not going to make it, right? So, so that screen knocks out a lot of businesses, right? And at some ends of this, some angel groups, you're talking about 90%. Just look at the executive summary. Look at what business this is. Not interested, doesn't fit. Then from the remainder of companies, you're talking about then making the decision for presentation. So between a quarter and a half of what's left there, the kind of 40, 10 to 40 percent, get chosen to present. And there people are looking for kind of when you read the business plan at all, is there some kind of strong competitive advantage? Does the business really have reasonable projections? Does there seem to be a market? Is there some development of the business? Those kinds of things to be worth the member's time trying to look at this business. Now, here's a sort of fascinating statistic. If we actually look at these angel groups and what they report in the time spent on this, the typical presentation, the median presentation is 20 minutes 
and 20 minutes of Q&A. That means you get 20 minutes to make your case to these groups. Now, some of them are five minutes presentations. I mean, what you're doing is saying, I have to sell a person on my business or a group of people on my business in a few minutes, right? And that initial decision about whether or not to go to, dil to due diligence is on that. I can tell you, and we have actually, there's a, a former, um, or actually still is a member of the Tech Coast Angels, a guy by the name of Rich Sudek out in California who decided to go get a PhD. And one of the things he studied in getting his PhD was how the angel group made decisions. And every group decision-making bias you can think of goes on. People horse trading, people actually being driven by whether or not they think that the entrepreneur is attractive, people being driven by whether or not the entrepreneur has a limp or firm handshake when they meet you in the beginning, whether they can engage in chit-chat. Okay? All of those things play in, which is important right? if you're trying to raise money because that stuff matters. It's also a little bit horrifying from the perspective of this is how people are making investments of their own money in, in startup uh, companies. Then the, the group it decides then, OK, do we go to due diligence or not? Right? Are we going to take bother to do an in-depth um, investigation? Now, in the case of the North Coast Angel Fund, one of the things that's really uh, interesting is we vote whether or not we want to do due diligence on a company. Then we also need to have three members of the group say they'll do the due diligence. It is not an infrequent occurrence that people will say, yeah, we should go to due diligence, but nobody will do it, and then nobody proceeds with the company. Right? Now, it could be that people say, oh, yeah, that'd be an interesting company, but I have no expertise, and so I'm not, I'm not interested in participating. But you've got a double. Um, uh, um, set of uh, criteria. One, you have to pass muster with people, and then the second is that the people have to think there that they have enough expertise to want to be able to evaluate. Generally, a subgroup does due diligence and kind of reports back with recommendation. Again, there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in the decision-making processes here. You've got a subgroup of people reporting back to try to persuade a group of people to uh, make uh, an, an investment then members generally decide whether or not to invest. And then generally, the group will pick somebody to monitor the investment that's been made by placing a person on the board of the company. Now, this is generally a really selective process. And to give you a sense of what we're talking about here, the typical angel group gets about 400 companies a year asking for money. About 24 companies present to the typical angel group every year, and about four get an investment. Okay, and the numbers are slightly higher. I don't know the numbers for um, the um, Archangels, but for the North Coast Angel Funds, the numbers are a little bit higher um, here, but they're not much higher. You're talking, you know, certainly, you know, um, on two hands, less a few fingers, the total number of companies that are going to get funded here. So. What do these deals look like when the angels are making the investment? Well, here's the thing that's kind of funny, that angel investments in general don't look very much like venture capital investments at all. But increasingly, angel groups are starting to look more and more like venture capital firms. They're trying to form a space in between individual angels and the venture capitalists. So in the typical angels out there, convertible debt is a very rare phenomenon, about 7% of investments. Money is not staged. People are not generally putting in their money, asking the entrepreneur to achieve a milestone, and then putting in more money. It's actually generally put in as a lump sum. Investor veto of management decisions is very rare. This is fairly common amongst venture capitalists, but it's rare, only about 5% of cases. And then actually about 40% are straight common stock, that the angel is buying common stock if they're not doing actually a um, debt so actually preferred stock, which is what the venture capitalists tend to do in terms of their investments, actually quite un relatively uncommon amongst the angels. 40% okay? of the investments actually involve debt. But angel groups are getting much more like VCs. So they rarely will do debt unless it's some kind of complicated convertible debt uh, uh, instrument, generally using preferred stock and tending to add venture capital-like terms and covenants. So one of the big things is um, angel groups 
trying to put in things like anti-dilution clauses. So when an entrepreneurs are asking for um, funding, the angels are asking that if subsequent rounds of investors come in, that the, invest the angels will not be diluted down. That's a very venture capital type um, condition. And it's rare amongst individual angels. And it's increasing amongst the angel groups. Yeah. Sure. One thing I can do is actually make available the slides to everyone. That's probably uh, the easiest thing at the at the end. Okay. Yeah. What percentage of the tax pay look for board seats? The uh, angels or the uh, so in general, most angels don't look for board seat. Um, do most of these companies. The groups tend to want a board seat. Or, or, or is the, uh, the, the main principle. Right. The. In general, for a typical angel deal where it's the individual, there's probably no board yet. If there's anything, it's a board of advisors, not a board of directors. Um, and even then, it's, it's not necessarily there. Angel groups tend to want a board seat and will generally try to occupy a board seat essentially until such time as, if they're lucky, other investors come along later and actually knock them off the board. Um, but in a way, if it, you can get a venture capitalist to follow on and put in enough money that you don't need to be on the board anymore, you're actually in good shape. So it's probably not too much of a, of a problem. Now, angel investors, how do they do with this activity? Now, this is something that's very hard to judge. Well, recently, we've got some evidence on angel group investors. And the ROI, 19.2% a year over um, a period that actually ended in 2006. Now, that's after the opportunity cost of the investor's time is factored in. Keep in mind right, that this isn't like putting money into somebody, your mutual fund, where you don't have to spend any time on it. If you're spending time, some portion of your compensation should be coming for you know, the value of your time. And you take that out, that's a pretty good return. right? It looks pretty good, except for the problem is most people who look at this don't believe it. And they don't believe it because of how the data is collected. So how do you get this information? You ask people to talk about their investments. Now, I can tell you that when you survey people and ask them about their investments, the ones who had a blockbuster exit are very quick to fill out the survey. And those who have managed to just lose money really don't fill them out so quickly. So my guess is that if you ask me, these numbers are biased upwards, and angels are not doing that well. Okay, on their investments. That's important because these numbers are significantly below comparable numbers for venture capital firms without even factoring in the bias of the responses. So angels are good investors in startups, these angel groups, but they're not at the level of returns of the venture capital firms. The other thing that's really important is how much variance there is. And this goes to the point, so you go to an angel group, are you getting a really good investor? Not necessarily. So 7% of the investments account for 3 quarters of all the returns. Okay? And 52% of the investments return less than the capital put in. Okay? So people are losing money on the majority of the investments that they make. Okay? And only about 40 companies um, are founded annually reach these sale targets in the industries that these investors are targeting. So they can't be making um, these, uh, most people are not making these huge returns. Some people are. And we do have evidence and know of angels who individually or angel groups that do have phenomenal returns. The Band of Angels has a documented internal rate of return of 55%, right? And so those um, successful, but it's actually made up of very successful angel investors. And one of the questions is, OK, so if I'm going to go to an angel group, if I don't have a choice and I need the money, I'm really not going to judge 
my investors. But if I have a choice, there's a price that I'm paying, which is the terms of the deal that somebody give me, gives me should be related to how much value that investor is providing. So if I had two investors, one that has a really good track record, one that has no track record at all, and um, the one with the really good track record is actually perhaps giving me slightly worse terms. You might be better off taking the ones with slightly worse terms to work with that uh, angel uh, there. What do the best angel investors do that's so different than others? The first is they're very, very selective. I keep putting up this same statistic because it's so important that, to point out how incredibly rare these successful investments are. Now, what does that mean? It means that the odds in any year that somebody will come to me and show me a business plan that will hit that target, turn out to hit that target, is low. Even if I say where I perceive there's a chance that they'll hit that target, it's low. That means that if I'm an angel investor, if I want to be a successful investor and that's what I need to hit those kinds of targets, I got to be really good at saying no. And if I kind of think that it's uncomfortable to say no, so I bend my rules a little bit on one business, and then I bend my rules a little bit on the next business. The next thing you know, I have a portfolio where the successful businesses are not good enough to give me my return. So the best investors are actually incredibly tough. They say, I have my standard. If it's not met, I don't do it and I don't bend. The second thing is, well, before that, they also don't believe projections. To give you a sense of this, um, only 500 companies hit that $50 million sales target. Okay? That would mean proportionately that businesses in Northeast Ohio, we should get somewhat less than one of these a year. The North Coast Angel Fund, I went back and I looked at the business plans that came into this group in the last calendar year. Okay, of the sort of round 400 plans that came in, about 75% project hitting that target. So what are you asking, you know, what are investors going to do? So 75% of these business plans that come in say they're going to hit that target, yet we know that there's probably going to be one company in this region that's going to hit that target. I'm going to look at those projections and say, OK, get another person who knows how to work Excel. OK, because it's, it's not meaningful, right? Everybody knows that they have to say this, but it's almost impossible to judge the business on the basis of what people say from projections. And there's a strong sense that that's what people are doing. High return expectations. What does that mean? 30 times my money or more is what the successful angel group members are looking for. If I put in $100,000, I'm going to get $3 million. Why? Because such a small percentage of my investments are going to hit. The only way I make the return is that the ones that hit are spectacularly successful. Okay? So if you don't have a spectacularly successful kind of business, that kind of potential, the investors won't be able to do it because they're going to say, I can't do this. I can't be that successful. 45% of um, angels have higher than 10 times return expectations. So the angel group members and the most successful ones have much higher expectations for how much they want to get as a return than most of the angel group members and certainly more than typical angels. They invest in the same industries as VCs. And this is a real problem for Northeast Ohio. The typical angel actually invests a lot in retail and personal services, because that's actually where businesses tend to be. That's not actually where the spectacular financial returns are made. They're made in the industries that the VCs tend to focus on. Okay? Venture capitalists in the past 25 years, 85% or so of their investments have gone into five industries, broadly defined. Medical devices, biotechnology, computer software and internet, computer hardware and peripherals and semiconductors. Okay? So if the successful angels invest in the same businesses as the venture capitalists, the successful angels are investing in a very, very small 
slice of businesses. But the successful angels realize that IPOs and acquisitions are concentrated there. There's a concentration of those exits there. And that they need the venture capitalists to make a follow-on investment. So they do that. What's tough here is we really don't broadly represent that specter, spectrum of businesses. Other than medical devices, we're not highly represented in those areas, which makes it very difficult to interest the kind of successful uh, angels that are out there. They conduct substantial due diligence. They really look hard at the businesses. I'm giving you some sort of statistics that when I was kind of working on a Fool's Gold, it was a little bit frightening to see. 25% of actual typical angels will invest in a business without seeing a business plan. A lot of people are sort of not taking due diligence very seriously. Only 15% of angels report doing extensive research. And more than half of angels will get no independent references. They'll just take the references the entrepreneurs provide. Right? That's a not a very effective way of doing due diligence. I will tell you, as part of the North Coast Angel Fund, the things that we have found about companies by doing due diligence and why we decided not to invest through that process is actually quite astonishing. There's a lot of things that are under the surface that people are trying, that they dig out, they say, you know what? There's a legal issue there. We really shouldn't invest. This person has a really bad track record of managing people. We really shouldn't invest. Accredited investors. There's a much higher performance from the wealthier investors. Part of this is there are fewer limitations up from the government what they can do. The bigger things are they can invest as part of a group more effectively, and they can put more money in. And there tends to be an effect of gravitating towards the more successful businesses that way. They're more involved with the portfolio companies. If we look at people who are members of angel groups, and we look at what's the difference between the top and the bottom of the group, the bottom third of those angels spend seven minutes per week per venture they invest in. All right, they're not spending actually enough time to probably figure out if the venture's doing OK. That's how little due diligence they're doing. And then the, uh, the, the more successful ones are actually putting in a lot of time. Now, what the difficult is that people have a job, too. And that's the reason why they're not putting in that much time. The thing is, if you want to make, if, the, if people want to be successful at this, they really do have to put in, in the time. The using the most appropriate financial instruments. I pointed out that 40% of the funding is debt, and 40% of angel-only rounds are common stock. But the successful angel investments almost always tend to be preferred stock investments. It's, it is the case that the more successful investors are focused on using better instruments. And they also avoid overvaluation. And this is something that's really difficult, I think, for entrepreneurs. Because you're going to somebody for money, and you're saying, I need x dollars. And I'm going to give up y percentage of my business. And that's going to actually say what the business is worth. Right? And it's in the interest of the investor for the business to be worth less. And the important thing for an entrepreneur to keep in mind is that the relationship between the return of the investor's return on investment and that initial valuation is curvilinear. That is, the more you increase the valuation to an entrepreneur's business, the faster you're adversely affecting your return on investment. So the single best way you can maintain a good investment return is keeping valuation low. And that's a, something that is a, a port point of great tension between entrepreneurs and investors, because the investor gives a little on the valuation, and they could really hurt their returns. Diversify. One of the things that we know is that people who invest across 10 or more investments, when they make these investments, tend to do much better. Actually, the return across investments is worse to investors. Uh, the, the return across investments is worse to the return to investors with multiple investments. That is, any given investment is worse than a person's portfolio. People do better as angels from diversification. And more than that, they're more successful. They get higher returns when taking their new money, they put it into new companies, as opposed to follow on and putting in subsequent money into the business where they invested earlier. 
Why is that the case? We're not really sure, but the most likely reason is because there's a very much a tendency when you reinvest to throw good money after bad. And you're much better off and the statistics show that if you diversify and end up taking $10,000 and put it in one entrepreneur's business and then go and not putting $10,000 in again to that same entrepreneur but going to another entrepreneur, you're much more successful. That's problematic again for entrepreneurs because you might need subsequent money. And the sophisticated angels are going to be worried that they can't tell the difference between the good and the bad and be resistant to putting in that money. So what are the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Quick question, when you talk about uh, holding down the investment, uh, the valuation, can you draw me a picture of that? Yeah, so, uh, so, so you come to me and you say you need $100,000. And I say, okay, um, I'll give you $100,000 for half your company. I'm going to own 50% of the company. If we do that, and we've now said that the company is worth $200,000, OK? So, so if I say to you, OK, fine, I, you want $100,000, I want 55%. I've now held down the valuation, right? That's what, that's what I mean. So what are the implications? Well, first of all, big implication is if this is really hard. If you want to raise money for angels, that is one of the most difficult things you can do. Um, I give you a, this is a story of, um, of, of somebody else, but um, Laura Bennett, who founded um, Embrace Pet Insurance, I actually had her come talk to my uh, students the other day and asked her to talk about what was the most difficult thing she's ever done as an entrepreneur in the starting of her business. And she said the single hardest thing was getting money from angels. It's very difficult. There are very few people. It's hard to get people to part with their own money. Um, there's all kinds of issues that people have. It's hard to find groups. There are not a lot of groups. When you get into a group and you haven't been successful, word spreads quickly. And then it's harder to get into other groups. Second is know what the angels are looking for. Know what people are trying to do when you're asking for money from them because you'll waste your time. If what you really, your business is really suited for is a bank loan, going to an angel is really wasting your time. And time is your most precious resource as an entrepreneur. Because if you spend money, your time on trying to get money from an angel that you're not going to get instead of selling to a customer, right? You've really lost a lot. Understand the process. Understand what's going on here. And also recognize that it isn't this hyper-rational process. This is human beings making decisions about things where a lot of people really don't know the answers. Um, angel groups are a very important type of investor that are growing for high potential businesses between angels and VCs. You got to be careful on who you choose. Many people don't, aren't successful uh, angels. If you choose people who provide nothing more than money, you should get that money cheap, OK? Because you don't want to pay a lot and get nothing more than money. And recognize that the best angels are different than the rest of the angels. And that's part of the reason that they're doing this. And they can do it, because they're a small minority of people who have been successful at this process. Questions, comments, challenges? Yeah. You know, the whole discussion kind of <coughs> begs the question if, from an angel investor or a group, if the returns are, are that risky, that scarce, why do they, why are you, why would you always look to hit a home run rather, and this really high rate of return? rather than a strategy of going for companies that are more likely to hit along a single or a double. And the companies that are going to have steady growth, maybe be at $10 million company at the end of five years and be profitable, rather than chase this one in, in literally a, a million companies that is going to be successful and grow to $50 million in five years. There's a, there are a couple reasons. The first has to do with the distribution of performance, that actually it's so incredibly skewed that when you can get the small number that actually get above these $50 million in sales, 
a number of them can hit as much as $200 million in sales in five years. And then the value of those companies when they go public is many multiples on their sales. It can be as high as five or six times annual sales right, as opposed to one-time sales for the acquisition of a typical private company. So one reason is that if you can hit the tail, the number is so astronomical that it's a better strategy than going for the middle. Second reason for not going for the middle is that it's hard to exit. It's very hard to take a company that's worth, that's got $7 million in sales and sell it. You certainly can't take it public, but to sell it, it's very difficult to sell it to a public company. If you sell it to a private individual or another private company, valuations tend to be fairly low. Right? That's sort of, when we look at the statistics on that, they tend to be low, so it's hard to do that. It's hard to generate a lot of money. And then the other is the transaction cost part of this, which is that the idea of drawing up multiple contracts with lawyers sitting on multiple boards right, is so time consuming and so expensive that it's very hard to do that so that it leads people towards the home run strategy. There's actually a point that I've actually talked about when I did some work for the Fund for Economic Future. The problem is that there's actually a real disconnect between angels and economic development mission in an area because there are so many companies that actually get to five, six, seven million dollars, and that's actually quite a sweet spot for economic development. But the investor community, it's not a sweet spot for them. And that's a disconnect, right? This is a good area to be in. Five million dollar business is great for an entrepreneur. It's great for job creation. It's great for economic development. It's lousy for investors, external investors. It's really hard to say, but usually it's a small percentage. You're talking about maybe 10% of the company. So you're talking about a valuation, in some cases maybe 5%. Valuation of companies between two and $4 million, that's the kind of company valuation that you're, that, that you're talking about. The angels are generally significant minority uh, investors. These are not people, when the groups are investing, that are trying to have a lot of ownership, and certainly not majority um, ownership. Um, for business that meets all those criteria, uh, what really it looks like it's got a good likelihood of hitting the $50 million threshold. What's the highest investment? Probably, I mean, if we look at the statistics on angel groups, you can get groups that'll go to a million and a half dollars on a company, right? They, it's hard to get beyond that, because what it takes to get even up to like a million and a half dollars, and that's actually, we're talking about groups largely in places like California where there's a lot of high tech startups, um, not here. The, the problem is the group can't be that small. Um, the members are to be very wealthy, and people have to have a lot of expertise, because probably that you're talking now about some biomedical company. And those are hard for people to judge if they don't actually know something about biomedical companies. Oh, yeah. um, so this is, this is a little bit tough to say because the statistics show that investments aren't down very much, right? Um, angels have not made fewer investments um, in the past six months than they were making prior to that. Now, part of this is driven by the fact that um, some of those investors are actually segregating their funds. And so they've kind of thought of the angel money separately than others. Now, part of this is that, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, that sometimes people, some portion of these people, some good portion of this activity is a hobby, right? And people describe this as, you know, more interesting than trying to put a ball in a hole 300 yards away. Right? That's kind of a description of the activity. When people do that, they're, if they're wealthy enough, they don't cut back. 
that, that's, so part of it is we haven't seen it yet. We probably will see it in the future. We'll probably see it in the fact that um, more new angel groups and funds are not forming at the pace they did a couple of years ago. So I see it in a um, couple of years. Um, one good thing for this region is particularly for the funds like the North Coast Angel Fund, that money's there. The money was put in by the investors. The state matched the money, and it's there. right? And it didn't go away, because it actually couldn't be invested in something. So the capital is available to make um, those investments. Individuals, it's a little harder, because if they had money and they didn't segregate it and they put it in the stock market, for instance, they got um, less of that. The really big problem from the state of the market is that it's impossible to exit. And so people aren't getting out. Um, there's no IPO market at all right now. So you can't take companies public. Um, acquisitions are way down. Particularly, the thing is that value, you get a much higher value for your company being acquired if the acquirer is public than if private. And it's the public companies that have been so beaten down that the exits aren't there. And so what, what where the space is actually best is where people are looking for money right at the earliest stage. Because if you're looking for money to start a company that you're going to exit in five years, people are actually much more receptive because they think that, frankly, we're all going to, you know, we're not going to have an economy anymore or things will be straightened out within five years, one or the other. As opposed to if I'm going to try to exit in two years, people say, I don't think so. Other questions or comments? If you need more than a million and a half, what's the next step? Then, well, it depends what you need the money for. So one 